Hello, I'm Scott Sonnen. Um, I am the uh, co-founder of a company called Innovation Scouts, but I also write a blog called Well That's Interesting Tech, which is all about trying to understand and communicate about technology in a way that regular people will understand. I've been working in technology since last millennia, which is always a great way of saying it. Um, makes me sound a lot older than I actually am. But um, so yeah, since uh, 93 really, I've been working in, in technology. I came here to Reading in 93 to study cybernetics and control engineering at the university here. And it was at the time the only university in the country that did that course. And I did it because I wanted to build a robot. And um, at the time it was things like uh, Terminator on, was, on, was in the cinemas and everything like that. And my mum said to me, you're either going to create something that destroys the planet or heals the planet, one of them. Go figure. So anyway, um, so I've been invited here today to talk about who controls the future. Um, I'll try and give you some, some introductions to maybe how the past is con can control the future and can help us see what the future might be or at least understand some of our attitudes towards that. Um, I'll talk about some of the trends that we're seeing right now and um, some, of the things, some of the big things that are happening and some of the small things we can do and then ultimately end up with a view on a, trying to answer that rather challenging question. Um, so who controls the future is a really interesting phrase. Um, you know, at school I had to read this book every week, I'm sure most of us did. So there's the phrase in here which is who controls the present, controls the past, who controls the past, controls the future. So this is all about understanding if you're able to manipulate what people thought happened and if, they, if something bad happened, people would rather not repeat the bad, they'd rather do something different to have a better outcome in the future. If it was a good thing that happened in the past, we'd want more of that and we want more of that in our future. So as I was, as I was, um, as I was thinking about this, I thought, well, let's have a look back at some of the technology innovations and some of the things that have happened in the not too distant past. So I'm not talking about the invention of fire or language or things like that, but something, something a little bit closer to home, considering how many of you travelled here today as well. Um, and I found out I found some very interesting facts. So, 1825, when the trains were being introduced, there were some really rather weird beliefs of what might happen <laughs> to people if you were to get on, on the train. Um, <laughs> okay. So you might lose a limb or two, I think that's still a risk, but you, you might lose that, but uh, the women's uterus is to be ripped out if you went above 50 miles an hour. That's a pretty fearful thing to be telling people. And I think, you know, now we look back at that and we think how ridiculous that is, but at the time, this was probably a very real present danger and a fear that people were, were experiencing and they were being told would happen. Don't board the train because you'll come out half a woman. Um, now, if we move beyond 1984 into 1992, and I picked this one because it's around the time that I started university and um, in cybernetics and control engineering, I was doing some virtual reality work, some augmented reality work, a lot of robotics, a lot of artificial intelligence in, as well. So this one kind of kind of fitted quite nicely. Um, but it's interesting that this was a quote that came back from 1992 where people were questioning if you have these virtual worlds and you do these things in virtual worlds that you think are real worlds, what's going to stop you doing it in the real world? Um, and this is a debate that is going on all the time at the moment anyway, just focusing on gaming. If you move into more of the virtual worlds where you, the, the difference between the real world and, and the virtual world is, is, is so faint that you can start to see that this is actually potentially a very, a very dangerous thing to be thinking about. Um, do you know, has anybody heard of an application or a program called Second Life? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Second Life is this, let's call it the computer game, where you can go into there, you can create your character, you can create your your property, you can and you can create your business. You it's you can actually create wealth. You can have relationships in there. You can get married in there. In fact, there was a case many years ago where somebody um, somebody was caught cheating with another woman on Second Life, even though it was digital. When they went to court, he was divorced by his wife because he was cheating even in the digital world. Um, 
And this has been going for a long time. Now, the creators of Second Life have now embarked on their biggest um, project ever to create a hyper real, real version of San Francisco within within uh, Second Life. So within that um, within that world, everything is recorded in high definition. And um, I was talking to somebody just a couple of weeks ago who said that when he tried it, if it wasn't for the weight of the equipment on him, he would have had an incredibly difficult time understanding that he was in a, in a made up world instead of the real world. Mm. He said even to the point if he fell asleep and woke up, it would not be, he would not really understand. So the line between real and, and virtual is becoming more and more blurred. But I think as we start looking at this, it's not just these technologies, it's all the other things that I've just mentioned as well, augmented reality, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, internet of things, connectivity, all of these things, Bitcoin, blockchain, all of these things coming together that is creating something that's um, quite an exciting time. So let that build out like that. Okay, good. Um, so actually why this is such an exciting time right now is because we don't just have the maturation of one piece of technology, but we have all of these things happening around us at the same time, not all of them fueling each other. So in one of my previous roles, I got to speak with um, one of the um, uh, media relation chaps from, from Verizon, and he was saying, he was telling me about this growth of their internet of things business, it's going to be enormous, you know, 5 billion devices by 2020. And this was four years ago, so it's probably changed since then. And he was saying, this is for, for them, it's not new. This, this idea of having things that talk to things is not new. They used to call it machine to machine communications. And they used to have things like, uh, I don't know, large JCBs connected. So if they, if they went walkabouts and were stolen, them, you could find them or they could at least alert things. Coke machines was the other fabled one where you'd have a Coke machine in the middle of nowhere because that happens in America. And um, when it runs out of Coke, it would send an alert. Hey, I need more Coke or Fanta or whatever it is. Other, other brands are available. <laughs> um, and um, so he said, we've had this for a long time, but what's changed now is because for a long time we've been down here, down here somewhere in terms of the number of connections. But what's changed is that the devices that we're connecting now, the price has gone through the floor. They're so cheap now. The, the way of connecting these things and collecting the data is now ubiquitous and so cheap as well. Where you store all of that data is now so cheap and so massive that they can now afford to collect all of this enormous amount of data from all of these billions and billions of devices in the hope that they can do something with it. And even if it's not just in the hope, they are doing things with it. But if you have all of that data, there's no point having all of the data if you can't do something with it. And that's where artificial intelligence is coming in because it's helping to find patterns in this data. It's helping to manage that data. But it's also, if you've got five and a half billion devices, you've not got 20 customers. You've probably got millions of customers to deal with. And you don't want millions of customers calling up your help desk. So also AI is helping to manage the customer experience as well. I was in some meetings today with some local councils about chatbots. And this is exactly, you know, we might think of AI as, um, you know, this kind of, um, you know, as I was saying earlier, the Terminator type thing. But right now, AI is doing very mundane, very simple, but quite important jobs around us. And one of them, as we see everywhere, chatbots. It's just a very simple example of what, I, um, what AI has been doing. So we have all of this, we have lots of other things here. I'm going to touch on this one a little bit later on, um, the diagnosing cancer. Um, but it's not just these things that are coming to maturity. We've got drones, we've got computer vision, and lots of other pieces of technology that are all coming together. So it's a really exciting time with lots of things happening, lots of capability, more than we've ever had before. And in Roger's event um, earlier this year, he was spent a lot of time talking about exponential growth and being in the second half of the checkerboard, which we can talk about later, but not here. But it's a really exciting and maybe a little bit intimidating time for many people. But the question I, I started thinking was, if we look back over time, where did the inspiration, where did the guidance, where did the direction come from? And if we go back to this handsome chap here, um, it was the kind of lone genius, the crazy inventor who couldn't afford to be a crazy inventor or a crazy genius, so he worked in a patent office. So then you know, these, were, these are the kind of mavericks that created the direction and changed the world with their ideas. Then later we moved into Gene Roddenberry from Star Trek, 
and you, we can't walk around a single day today without experiencing something that his mind helped create somehow even from the sliding doors as you walk into a building you know psh, psh, from, mm -hmm. from star trek that's that's there the things i've got on these things here i remember there was a cartoon when i was a kid called dick tracy mm -hmm. yeah and he always yeah. used to speak into his watch and these kind of creative thoughts came here now we're in an era where it's the technology companies that seem to be directing us and guiding us to where we're trying to go but What's really interesting is in doing that, even though they've got this enormous amount of power, they're giving us, these individuals, even more power than they can imagine. It has never been easier to live this ambition. You know, the quote from Bob Proctor, if you, essentially if you can imagine it, if you can imagine something, you can hold it in your hand, you can create it. it we're, in, we're in a world where it's never been easier to think of something and get to the point where it's Jason Silver. If you've heard of Jason Silver, he talks about how, you know, redefining the term of billionaire, not in terms of wealth, but being able to touch a billion lives. We've never been in a world where it's been easier to take your idea and impact a billion lives. And it's because all of this stuff that that journey brings, brings us, the AI, the IoT, the cloud services, all of these things are lowering costs, creating you know, opening up things to allow other people to be creative and make something happen. And I pick a couple of names here, you probably know a couple of those over there, but I use them just as a little bit of an example because um, Twitter started off as a side project in a media agency, I think it was. And it wasn't until that media agency was struggling that they were like, oh, what's this kind of thing? This is kind of cool. And they took it out to market, they got investors, and now it's, it's changed the way we communicate. We work. Um, the guy who started this, he was originally making baby clothes with padded knees called crawlers. <laughs> and he was making those and getting nowhere. And then he went and started working with a friend and they, rent, they rented out an empty space. And it was like, well, we could rent this up to other people. And then through the power of networking and things like Twitter and stuff like that, they grew the business to $20 billion. It was a really exciting thing. And, and Khan Academy was something that Roger was speaking about as well. Um, and I have to mention Unsplash. Unsplash um, is where I got all the photos from. Um, Unsplash came about, for, it's a completely free resource of really high quality images. And it came about from some, um, some photographers who were doing photo shoots. And like, we've got all of these photos that we don't need for the client. What are we gonna do with them? So they created this platform now and there's billions of photos are downloaded from this platform. Um, and it's free, but you need to cite that you use them. So I use Unsplash, so that's that. <laughs> um, uh, so, so yeah, so all of those companies are now a billion dollar or, or, not, or more now, um, but they were started 10, 15 years ago, some of them, maybe some of them longer. And the world has changed so much since then. So if you can do that from a side project now, what you, what you can do starting today will be even bigger than that. But if we're talking big, there's a lot of big things that can happen with technology. We've got the circular economy. Now this is really something I'm getting more and more interested in understanding and trying to figure out how to be a part of that and help that. There's some really exciting companies around here working in that space. You've got this idea that maybe artificial intelligence can bring the ends to governments. I have this crazy idea that maybe, maybe you could take all the party policies and manifestos and put them into some big AI which would actually validate them and say, you know, that promise is completely rubbish. You're never going to achieve that. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great to actually have an independence <laughs> to crunch all the numbers, all of those scenarios, all of those crazy possibilities, taking in geopolitical this and that, and actually say, you know, you're absolutely crazy. That will never work. Yeah, that wouldn't, that, wouldn't that be amazing? And then there's obviously climate change. So there's a lot of hope around how AI, how AI can help us with climate change. And the one thing with AI that you really have to remember is the fear of it, the expectation of it is always more than it can actually be right now. You know, I was working in AI back in 93 and it's been going since the seventies. And it's the interesting thing about how AI is defined is it's essentially to kind of paraphrase it. It's things human humans do that computers can't really do. But as soon as computer can do it, it's no longer really AI because a computer can do it. So 
if you think of, um, you know, when you take a picture of something and it translates that picture into the text in a Word document, so op uh, OCR, optical character recognition, or object character recognition, that used to be called AI. We don't call it AI anymore, we call it OCR. And in fact, there was a company I met that was doing AI for OCR. And it's like, oh, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> so when we're thinking about all of these doomsday predictions, not, and not even doomsday predictions, but these things about, well, we can save the planet using AI, you just got to ask, can we? Will it? How? I don't want to kind of burst any bubbles. We can do a lot, but we've just got to be mindful over what we think it can do and not have these false expectations or these false fears. But these are the big things, and they can be haunting, they can be daunting, they can be really difficult to grab, grab hold of. You know, how do I get involved in that? How can I make a difference? Now, with all of these tools that are now available, you can start very, very small and have a big impact. And I'll just tell you a personal story, um, how, I, how I started something, um, how it's got to a certain point, and now I'm looking for partners to help me take it somewhere else. It's my nan. <laughs> she was 92 a couple of weeks ago. She's very frail, um, and she lives on her own, um, up in Harrow, and she spends most of her day at this, at this table watching people go by. Our family's kind of spread out quite a bit. Um, we don't get to see her as much as we should. She was getting very lonely. And I've got small children, and she was always asking, how are the kids? What are they doing? Are they big now? Are they speaking now? It's like, yes, they were speaking now. Far too long ago. Um, so she had, there's none in this picture, but she had these little you know, digital photo frames. And we used to send pictures, and my cousins would go there every now and then, and they'd take a USB stick, and they'd swap it around. But it was just really clunky and it never really worked and they were on small screens like this. So I created this here. This is, um, in this box here, which has fallen off the back because she was fiddling with it, um, <laughs> is uh, there's a little Raspberry Pi. And in this box here, there's a little sensor. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Um, but the family are able to email photos and able to email videos to her. Um, it's offline, all of the data is stored offline, so there's no worry about privacy. As soon as it's got to her, it's deleted offline, it's, it can't be hacked. Um, and it just sits there and it goes on this big screen that she can see without her glasses. I mean, though they're around her neck, I think. Um, she, can see the, she can see it and she literally spends her whole day sitting there watching the videos, watching the, watching the photos. And every time I call her, she spends 80% of the call saying how wonderful it is. Now, this has had a massive impact on her life, but it's also had an impact on her family as well, because that little sensor there, it's got two purposes. One is it's an infrared sensor like you have on your lights, you know, PIR sensor. Um, and my nan, she's of the generation where everything needs to be switched off. When she leaves the room, everything needs to be switched off. The problem with things like this is if you switch them on and off, they break. <laughs> so I'm like, don't touch it, don't touch it. This little box of magic will turn it off. When you're not in the room, it will turn off. And when you come back in the room, it will turn on again. So she loves that, except for when she forgets and she turns it off, she breaks it and I have to go there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, that's only happened twice. Uh, but the other thing is that's creating some information for the family. You know, older people, they tend to have a set routine. And by understanding when she gets in that room and when it lights up and when she leaves that room and when she doesn't, then that sends us warning bells. So actually there was a time a few months ago where my system was saying, something's wrong, something's wrong. And I looked at the logs and said, no, 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 everything's fine. What's wrong? Yeah, Nana's get 8.35, she's in that room. <laughs> 8.35am, I know she's in there. And it was telling me 8.35, 8.35, 8.35. And I was in the process of building some AI to understand what it is. And it turns out that the thing that was wrong was nothing to do with her, it's to do with my box. Because she'd been turning it on and off, <laughs> it had lost the timestamp, and it was telling me that it was 8.35 in the morning in 2016. So <laughs> it kind of worked. But the point, the point was really that with this information, I'm now able to get an alert if my nan's pattern of behavior changes. Now, I am looking for partners to try and help me grow that um, and take that somewhere else. Um, because I think that can have a massive impact in many, many families, many, many older people that can make them more independent. Um, so the last slide, trying to come back onto the topic, I do, I do go away from it every now and then, 
But who controls the future? I, th I think it really depends what you think and what you believe and what you want to do. So there's three school schools of thought on here. There's a school of thought where we're just atoms and everything's atom, so you can't really distinguish between a turnip and an iPhone. And if you have that kind of school of thought, then as AI and technology evolves, then what's to stop technology doing everything that we do? Not much, really. You then have dualism in the middle where you have kind of the separation between the structural and the made and the physical and those things and the spiritual world and the thoughts and the emotions and the kind of things that we believe make us humans compared to the machines. Now if you're thinking in that in that realm then there's a place for machines, there's a place for people um, but they kind of they kind of separated. It's difficult no matter I was watching a really interesting film last night on cloning and mind mapping. It's fascinating. It's really good for today, but we'll talk about that later. Um, and then there's the area I think I believe more, the humanistic. So this is where you have man and machine working together to do better things. And if we go back all the way to the beginning of this talk, where I was talking about all of these things that we have invented, all of these technologies we have brought to market, fire, um, language, writing, um, transportation, money, all of these things have somehow helped us to go on and be bigger, better humans, and some, you can argue some of them haven't, but most of them in general have helped us be more, do more, be more productive. And I really think that with the right thoughts, the right people, giving control to people, not necessarily organisations, empowering them, we can find a path forward that is where it's not a man or machine that's creating the future, controlling the future, it's all of us working together. So I've run out of time, but I'm happy to talk to you about that use case at the end, diagnosing cancer with machines and humans uh, later on. So, thank you.